Today is Saturday, August 26th. It's back to school season, not just for kids in school districts, but also, unfortunately, for the cyber criminals who target school systems. Because, yes, cyber threats against American schools have become a greater concern in recent years. This time last year, the FBI put out a warning about the growing problem. And our guest expert today says it is still happening. In fact, he says there's a new cybersecurity breach or incident at a U.S. school every single school day on average, affecting schools of all sizes. Doug Levin is the co-founder and national director of the K-12 Security Information Exchange, which is a national nonprofit dedicated to helping schools protect themselves from emerging cybersecurity threats. Today, he is helping us understand why schools are such valuable targets for cyber criminals and what's at stake for students. Plus, more importantly, he shares what both schools and parents can do now and in the future to safeguard children's data as well as protect those already overstretched school resources. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy Special Edition Saturday, when we sit down with a different expert or celebrity every Saturday to talk about something in the news. Don't forget to tune in every Monday through Friday for our regular episodes, where we provide all the day's news in 10 minutes. I'm Erica Mandy. It's now time for today's Special Edition Saturday. Hi, Doug. Thank you for joining us here on the Newsworthy. It's my pleasure to be with you. So a year ago, in 2022, the FBI warned about an increased risk of cyber attacks against schools specifically. And it was around the same time that the L.A. public school district, the second largest in the country, was dealing with ransomware. So what really prompted that warning a year ago? And do you think the threat level is just as high this year for schools? Since about 2019, school districts specifically have been increasingly targeted by criminal threat actors largely based overseas. Certainly last year's uh, FBI alert was actually prompted by the LA incident. It came out uh, soon thereafter. Uh, but this is an issue that's been growing uh, in concern for K-12 IT leaders and, and others across the sector. Um, unfortunately, uh, as schools rely more and more on technology, they are uh, increasingly vulnerable to these sorts of risks. And there is a criminal element that is interested in taking advantage of that, uh, primarily to, to generate money for their criminal uh, endeavors. A lot of organizations, businesses, everyone pretty much is relying on technology. So why do you think schools are so vulnerable? Or is it that we're just focusing on them because these are supposed to be safe places for kids? You certainly think that maybe federal government agencies or banks or credit card companies or even private businesses might have might be more valuable to cyber criminals. But the fact of the matter is that they're looking for relatively soft targets and schools are under resourced. And this is an issue that they've not had to deal with for a long time. So they definitely fit that uh, category. And while we don't think of schools as rich institutions, they're actually quite large organizations. You know, they maintain uh, facilities, transportation, food service. Uh, a medium sized school district could have an annual budget of hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, some of the largest school districts in the country, you know, we were talking about L.A., their annual budget is $10 billion a year. So these are very large organizations that are not particularly well defended with a lot of sensitive data and not a lot of appetite for them to be sort of knocked offline and not serving their communities. And is it mostly ransomware specifically? And if so, can you describe that for people? Schools actually fall victim to a wide array of cyber incidents, just like any other organization. So the most frequent type of incident that a school district experiences is a data breach. School districts are also subject to phishing emails, phishing email attacks. And then uh, the, the type of incident that keeps people up most at night and is most disruptive are ransomware attacks that first exfiltrate sensitive data from school district networks and then lock them down and make, basically make them unusable. And in exchange, they uh, make an extortion demand. And these extortion demands can stretch into the millions or multi-millions of dollars, you know, to essentially to unlock those devices, those networks, and also to promise not to release any sensitive data they exfiltrated. You know, in addition to the, the costliness of, of responding, Ransomware incidents have actually forced school districts in some cases to close entirely for uh, several days. And in some cases, the response has knocked 
uh, school district IT systems offline for weeks or months or have resulted in the loss of a lot of valuable data. Folks may not quite realize this, but you know, schools maintain a fair amount of inf- information about the medical status of students if they've um, had engagements with law enforcement, if they've been dealing with any sort of behavioral issues, um, if there are issues in the home, they may know immigration status. Um, so there's a lot of very sensitive information that schools are privy to, and that can, at the very least, cause some embarrassment if it is made public, if not really cause you know sort of severe distress to individuals. Yeah, that's kind of my next question, and you're alluding to it, but what is the actual risk? So data gets out. Uh, how can that continue to be used, if at all, against people? Right. So I would say there's a couple of risks, depending on how you look at it. Sort of at the at the meta level, when a school district experiences an incident like this, it may cost millions of dollars to respond. And you know that's money that is not then going to the classroom. Uh, and to students directly, but to shoring up IT systems that were weak in the first place. And on the dark web, cyber criminals who are interested in identity theft actually value children's identity information more than yours and mine. And that's because the identity information of minors is not monitored and can be abused for years and years And it may not be until a a student applies for a a student loan to go to college or tries to qualify for their first apartment lease, and they find out that their credit rating has been destroyed. I want to talk about preventative measures, but first, how do schools typically respond and how should they respond? What can they do after the fact? After the fact, schools are really between a rock and a hard place. And I'd be hesitant to provide too much heavy-handed uh, advice. Really, the best circumstance here is is prevention, right? And an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure. But are schools paying ransoms? I mean, is, is that their only choice or dealing with the, the consequences? Law enforcement get involved? What, what do you see happen? We have seen school districts or insurance companies on behalf of school districts negotiate with these threat actors and pay these extortion demands. And any time a school district does that, they're really painting a target on the backs of every other school district around the country because it encourages threat actors to continue to target school districts. Certainly, if you talk to law enforcement, they will never, ever uh, encourage any victim to pay a criminal actor. But once you become a victim, as I said, you're between a rock and a hard place and you may not have a lot of good choices because if you don't pay that extortion demand, uh, you may not be able to open your doors uh, to students the next day. You may you may not be able to meet payroll. And that's just a real world judgment call that has to be made by that school district leadership on what's going to sort of minimize the harm to the community, given that that incident has already happened. Okay, so now we need to know what can we actually do about all of this? How can schools and parents help to prevent these cyber attacks in the first place, or at least safeguard children's information? Doug Levin shares actionable advice and even gives us reason to feel optimistic. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But first, a quick break for our sponsors. The nutritional drink AG1 has become part of my morning routine. I first gave AG1 a try because we were talking about partnering and I wanted to make sure I actually liked it. Well, I now take AG1 every day before I eat anything else, and I was surprised how quickly I started noticing a difference. It makes me feel ready to take on the day. I feel a boost in energy. I find myself not reaching for coffee or tea quite as often. And if you're not familiar, AG1 can replace a lot of other supplements like a daily multivitamin, minerals, pre and probiotics for gut health, adaptogens, and a greens blend. And you get it all in just one scoop of powder. I always put ice water with a splash of lemon juice, mix, and I'm all set. AG1 is made from 75 of the highest quality whole food sourced ingredients from around the world, intentionally curated for their ability to nourish all of the body's systems in harmony. So if you are looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash newsworthy. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash newsworthy. Check it out. This episode is also brought to you by Honey Love. If you want to look and feel better in your clothes, Honey Love has the best shapewear. 
And now I'm learning they also have the best leggings. Yes, I just got their legging 2.0 and I'm pretty obsessed. The material is super smooth and soft. You'll feel the difference right out of the box. Plus, they perfectly hug my body with hidden shaping panels, making me feel more confident. And yet they're still really comfortable and easy to move around in. I even love these side pockets they have. They add zero bulk to my legs, but still give me that option for convenience so I can put my ID or phone in there if I need to. And the sheer proof fabric ensures I don't have to worry in the middle of yoga class. I highly recommend these leggings. And as I've mentioned before, Honey Love is also the go-to for shapewear. It's sculptwear that is actually comfortable. They're surprisingly easy to take on and off, and they help make all my clothes hang just right. So treat yourself to the best shapewear and the best leggings on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash newsworthy. Again, use our exclusive link to get 20% off at honeylove.com slash newsworthy. Okay, now back to our conversation. So what can schools and parents do to prevent or at least prepare for a ransomware or other cyber attack? Let's start with schools and then we'll talk about parents. Some of the best ways uh, or most important ways, I would say, that school systems can protect themselves uh, first would be to, to make sure they know what services they have exposed to the Internet. And they need to make sure they know what those are, make sure that those are patched and up to date and protected. Secondly, they really should MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication, really should be something that all staff are uh, required to use. And then finally, it's important that school districts place some some centralized controls in place that restrict uh, the ability of an individual teacher or administrator to download a file that then is able to spread across an entire school network and bring that school district down. Is there anything parents can do, even if that is, you know, trying to be more conscious about what data they are providing the school or maybe asking the right questions or advocating for more measures like this? So I think that's a terrific point. There are some technical things that I would encourage parents and, and families to, to think about. Um, the first is it's it's important not to reuse account names and passwords uh, that you use for school with other services. In fact, it's, it's not a good idea to reuse them at all. Secondly, uh, we always actually always encourage parents to put a freeze on the credit records of their minor children. Um, This is something that is freely available to parents. It's offered by all of the three major credit reporting agencies, uh, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. And this would restrict the opportunity for a cyber criminal to open an account in their children's name. Um, And it's also something that can be easily uh, reversed when that uh, child is, is ready to open up credit accounts in their own name. And you're saying to do this even before any sort of attack hits a school? Absolutely. It is a little bit counterintuitive, but these credit reporting agencies open accounts on individuals, you know, without our request, uh, in many cases without our knowledge. So as a parent proactively opening that account and freezing it, keeping it from being abused, that's a, that's a proactive step that we recommend parents take. You know, public schools as public institutions really do value and need to take into account parent voice and parent input. And I think it's important that parents raise questions about the types and amount of data that schools are collecting, whether that data is deleted, making sure that that's deleted when it's no longer needed, um, and to ask you know questions about how their children's data is being protected and how the school system is otherwise defending against these cybersecurity risks, because of course it's their taxpayer dollars that are funding the school systems as well. Uh, there are definitely school systems around the country that um, are doing quite a lot in this arena, uh, but unfortunately, uh, there are many school systems where this issue is just sort of not really on their radar screen. And until you know federal and state policymakers take this more seriously, those disparities across districts are going to persist and put, unfortunately, you know, too many people at unnecessary risk. Is there any data at this point about how widespread this is, what percentage of schools in the U.S. are impacted or anything like that? And I and I understand it's also underreported. So can you speak to that? 
Yeah, I, I would say I would take any statistics about cybersecurity incidents with a big grain of salt, largely because there is not sort of a mandatory reporting regime in place. Um, so victims don't always come forward, including school districts with their own school communities. At K-12-6, at my organization, we actually have been tracking publicly disclosed school cybersecurity incidents. And we see a school incident on average uh, about every school day uh, happening across the U.S. We've seen over 1,600 incidents from 2016 to 2022. Uh, and already this school year, which is just starting, uh, we've seen dozens of incidents occurring all across the country. So this is a bit of a quiet crisis going on. I think people are really not always aware um, how frequently these sorts of incidents are happening, but it's certainly not, it certainly happened to school districts of all sizes and types, the very largest, the very smallest, rural, urban, um, from Alaska down to Florida, from Maine out to Hawaii. So really everyone is at risk and it's really prudent, uh, frankly, if you're in a school district to presume that you're going to be a victim, because really it's just a matter of uh, when, not if. Final thought or takeaway that you want our audience uh, to leave today with. This is an issue that is top of mind of school district IT leaders across the country now, where it really wasn't just a few years ago. That awareness is terrific. And it's really encouraging now that the federal government has recognized and heard the voice of school district leaders and parents that this is an important issue. And we're looking for more support from them going forward. So that is certainly encouraging. What we really need to make uh, big progress, frankly, would be resources. Resources to help school districts put in place better protections for their communities. That's what we would need to really get the shot in the arm to really make dramatic progress. But uh, we're in a much better place than they were just a few years ago. Uh, I think we can take a lot of steps that will reduce a tremendous amount of risk that are, you know, it's not that difficult to make make a lot of headway. Uh, and hopefully that will better protect school communities, or at least if they do experience an incident, they're able to recover much more quickly and gracefully than if they weren't prepared for it. Well, thank you so much to Doug Levin and his nonprofit for sharing all of this information. Be sure to check out the organization, the K-12 Security Information Exchange, or K-12-6 for short. For more information, visit their website at k126.org. We'll link to it in today's episode notes. Well, thank you for tuning into the Newsworthy Special Edition Saturday. If you haven't already, give our regular 10-minute news roundups a try as well. Those episodes are available every Monday through Friday to keep you in the know. And hit that subscribe or follow button in your favorite audio app so you can make sure you get all of these new episodes each day and stay informed. We'll be back on Monday. Until then, have a great weekend.